A while back, while I was checking Deuteronomy in the Mixteco language of Mexico, we came to chapter 32, which is a whole lot of difficult poetry. Verse 8 stood out as one of the most complex verses to navigate and explain, mainly because of a textual variant. The big debate is whether to read the original text as saying sons of God or sons of Israel. And getting to a solid answer isn't simple. English translations still don't agree on it, but we're going to do our best to tackle it in this episode and see where the Mixteco translation landed. I'm Andrew Case, and you're listening to Working for the Word. get into Deuteronomy 32, we need to talk about the different kinds of Hebrew that we find in the Hebrew Bible. Unfortunately, we don't have a uniform Hebrew throughout the whole text. And that's because, if you think about it, the Hebrew Bible was written over a span of many, many more centuries than the New Testament was. So, New Testament, the Greek is much more uniform in that sense. You know, we're not talking about a thousand-year jump between one book and the next in, in the sort of language that's used. But the Hebrew Bible has that going on, and so we'll find archaic Hebrew in some parts, we'll find standard or classical Hebrew in other parts, and then we'll also find late Hebrew in books like Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah. So, archaic Hebrew isn't as common because there was a lot of editing going on later on to make the Hebrew Bible more uniform, a lot of updating along the way. But we do have archaic chapters that remain, like Judges 5. We talked about that before in past podcasts. We've also got Deuteronomy 32, which we're talking about today. Genesis 49, Jacob's blessing. We've also got Exodus 15 and then some Psalms scattered in there. But basically, the majority, the vast majority of the Hebrew Bible is classical or standard Hebrew. So basically, all that to say, the chapter that we're going to be talking about is archaic Hebrew. And on top of that, it's poetry. So that means it's hard. So, I think it would be good to start off reading some of the wider context of Deuteronomy 32. It starts in 31, 30, saying, Then Moses spoke the words of this song until they were finished in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew. Like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of Yahweh, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay Yahweh, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So those last two were verses 8 and 9. Let me read them one more time because these are going to be the focus of this episode. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. And if you look at the footnote 
on the ESV, on the sons of God in verse 8, you'll find them explaining that the reading sons of God comes from a Dead Sea Scroll and the Septuagint, but that the Masoretic text lacks sons of God. So before we do anything else, let's see what the Masoretic text actually has in Hebrew here. The last three words are lemispar bnei Yisrael. So we have to the number of the sons of Israel, or according to the number of the sons of Israel. So the lamed, those who know Hebrew, the lamed there is a preposition, lemispar. Now, if the average translator has access to English, they can look at the United Bible Society's handbook on Deuteronomy, and this is what the note says. So, in their text, they have, according to the number of the sons of God, as their base text. They say the Hebrew text is literally the number of the sons of Israel, meaning the number of Israelites. The Septuagint has according to the number of angels. The NRSV text is more accurate according to the number of gods. Its footnote explains that this is based on some Qumran manuscripts as well as the LXX and gives the rendering of the Hebrew as the Israelites. The Hebrew Old Testament text project gives it an A rating as number of gods to be the correct text, and it should be translated. The sense is that in accordance with the number of gods, Yahweh divided humankind into separate peoples so that each people would have its own god, and Yahweh reserved Israel to be his own people. See 419 through 20. An alternative model, then, is he determined where each nation should live, each with its own God, which he chose, end quote. So, this is an interesting note. If you're the average translator and you're not a specialist in textual criticism, what would you do with this? Now, I have a couple problems with this note. First of all, it doesn't give the translator any leeway, any flexibility to go with what would be the traditional rendering of this text, which is according to the Masoretic text. Any country that has a legacy translation in the trade language, like Mexico, you know, with the Spanish Reina Valera, or in the U.S. with the KJV, they're going to have something probably based on the Masoretic text rendering, which is Sons of Israel. And that is actually the case. If you go to the KJV, it says sons of Israel. If you go to the Reina Valera, it says sons of Israel. Even the NIV has chosen sons of Israel. So in my mind, you should always give the translator the option to go with the legacy translation in the language of wider communication. And then number two, you should always give a reason why somebody might want to go with the other rendering. Why would the Masoretic text have this in the first place, and how could it make sense? If it doesn't make sense at all theologically or within the meta narrative of Scripture, then fine, explain why, but you should be able to explain one of those two things. So that's basically what we're going to do right now. And we're going to start with the external evidence. So if you're not familiar with textual criticism, you usually have two categories of evidence. You have the external evidence that you discuss, and then you move on to the internal evidence. External is, you know, what are the manuscripts? What are the readings? And then the internal is, okay, how could this have happened Which is the harder reading? Would there be theological motivations for the scribe to change this text, for example? So let's get started with the external evidence. We've already heard the Masoretic text. Now we have a Dead Sea Scroll, 4Q37 or 4Q Deuteronomy J, which reads, B'nai Elohim, sons of God. We also have the Samaritan Pentateuch. This has sons of Israel. We have a Targum, which has sons of Israel, and then we have the Septuagint, which is a little more complicated because there are different Septuagint manuscripts. Some of them say angels of God, and some say huion theu, sons of God. And that is actually what the Göttingen Septuagint edition goes with, based on the evidence. We have the Old Latin, which is basically based on the Septuagint, which has angels of God. Then we have the corrections of Aquila, Symmachus, and Theodotion to the Septuagint, and all of them corrected it to say, sons of Israel. Finally, we have the Syriac and some more Targums that support sons of Israel as the reading. 
So basically what this debate boils down to with the external evidence is a competition between the oldest manuscripts and the most manuscripts. The greatest number support sons of Israel, and the oldest manuscripts, the Dead Sea Scroll, the Septuagint, support sons of God. So we can already tell that this is going to be a tough decision, right? So we have to move on to the internal evidence. Now, before we do that, I want to take a look with you at some of the other major translations and how they have dealt with this. We've got the NIV with Sons of Israel. We've got the NLT with His Heavenly Court. We've got the Berean Study Bible, Sons of God, New American Standard Bible, Sons of Israel, Christian Standard Bible, People of Israel, Contemporary English Version. He assigned a guardian angel to each of them. Net Bible, according to the number of the heavenly assembly, and then all the old versions like Tyndale, Coverdale, Bishop's Bible, Geneva Bible from the 1500s have children of Israel. So let's talk about some reasons people would want to go with the Masoretic text, sons of Israel. First of all, this takes the reader back to the table of nations in Genesis 10 and 11, where we find a catalog of 70 nations. And this accords and parallels perfectly with the fact that in Genesis 46, 27 and Exodus 1, 5, we see that there were 70 members of Jacob's family that went to Egypt. So the connection is totally plausible and logical that Moses was making these connections in his mind. Table of nations with the number of the sons of Jacob that went to Egypt. Now, the second reason people might want to avoid the Septuagint reading or the Dead Sea Scroll reading, Sons of God, is because it seems to make God the creator of polytheism. Now, we have to keep in mind that a scribe might have been tempted to do this as well, out of a sense of piety, would say, I'm going to smooth this out a little bit because it might seem to make God out to be the author of polytheism or something like that. So, there's this debate about whether to understand a background in Ugaritic mythology here or not. So, you have this Ugaritic mythology where El fathered 70 sons. So, at this point, it's important to consider which reading would have given rise to the other reading. Is it more logical and more likely that a scribe would have accidentally or intentionally changed sons of God to sons of Israel or sons of Israel to sons of God? And I believe that it is highly unlikely that a scribe would intentionally change sons of Israel to sons of God. It would almost certainly be the other way around. But another one of the smoking guns in all of this comes from Deuteronomy 32, 43. So the same chapter, the same poem, we have this other thing that is highly unlikely that it was just coincidental. So here's what I'm talking about. The Masoretic text in verse 43 seems to have omitted a whole line of the poem that talks about the sons of God. So you have a Dead Sea Scroll, 4Q, Deuteronomy Q, has, O heavens, rejoice with him, bow down to him, all Elohim, all gods. The Septuagint has, O heavens, rejoice with him, bow down to him, all sons of God. The book of Hebrews in Hebrews 1.6 seems to be affirming the existence of this line by saying, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Now, he may be referring also to Psalm 97.7, which says, let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods which the Septuagint renders there as angeloi, as angels. Another important piece of this puzzle that we have to consider is Psalm 82, a psalm of Asaph. Let me read it to you. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And then jumping down to verse 6, I said, you are gods. Sons of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, 
judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So here we have a relatively clear revelation of this so-called divine council or these heavenly beings in God's court that serve him. Now, to unpack this idea a little more, let me read to you a quote from Dr. Peter Gentry in his book, How to Read and Understand the Biblical Prophets. He begins by quoting Isaiah 34, 5, For my sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. So he asks, what on earth does the Lord mean when he says that his sword has drunk its fill in the heavens? Behold, it descends for judgment upon Edom. There is a passage in an earlier section that explains in plain prose what is described here in metaphors and figures of speech. Isaiah 24, 21 through 22. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison. And after many days, they will be punished. In the ancient world, people believed in a close connection between events on earth and events in heaven. According to the Bible, every kingdom consists of human subjects, a human ruler, and a heavenly principality or power who rules over the earthly king and kingdom. This is also clear from Daniel 7 and 10, where we see heavenly beings or princes in charge of the nations and behind the activities of the nations. Isaiah also mentions the heavenly powers who must be punished. Just as in 2421, where God punishes first the evil spiritual powers ruling over the nations and then the nations themselves, so in 271, he punishes the dark powers in heaven, Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, before his sword comes to the earth to deal with nations in rebellion against him. The language here comes from Deuteronomy, here we go, 32, 40, through 42, where the nations whom God has used to discipline his own people have wrongly concluded that they achieved the victory by their own power and the power of their false gods. So God will judge the nation of Edom as representative of all nations in rebellion against God. In Isaiah 34, 5, the statement that the sword of Yahweh will drink its fill in the heavens and descend to the earth means the same thing as what we find in 24. God will first judge the heavenly rulers and then the earthly kings of the corresponding earthly kingdoms, end quote. Now, Paul affirms this in Ephesians 6, 12, where he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So now you can see some of the reasons why translators like the ESV and others would go with sons of God over sons of Israel. Because there's this whole theme in the meta narrative of scripture acknowledging the existence of these heavenly beings or heavenly rulers besides God, who are subordinates. But still, the texts of Scripture that we just looked at seem to imply that there's some kind of influence coming from these beings to the earth. So, taking all of this into account, let's go back and read once again in the ESV, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. Now, in his commentary on Deuteronomy, Tigay suggests the following, that these passages seem to reflect a biblical view that As punishment for man's repeated spurning of his authority in primordial times, in Genesis 3 through 11, God deprived mankind at large of true knowledge of himself and ordained that it should worship idols and subordinate celestial beings. He selected Abraham and his descendants as the objects of his personal attention 
to create a model nation. End quote. Now, this seems to be supported by Deuteronomy 4.19, which says, Beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that Yahweh your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. The last part of the verse reads as follows in the Net Bible. For Yahweh your God has assigned them to all the people of the world. Now, pulling all of this back to actually getting it translated into an an indigenous language of Mexico, of course, my translator that I was working with did not have access to all these English versions, all these English commentaries and guides. So, my job as a consultant is to be an interpreter, basically, and help walk her through all of these things so that she can make an informed decision. Now, right at the beginning, there are two options for the consultant in this kind of situation. The consultant can just take the easy way out and say, okay, I'm going to suggest that we just go with the text of the most widely read version in Spanish of Mexico, which is the Reina Valera. So, we'll just take the text that they went with, and we won't even talk about this. We're just going to translate Sons of Israel and be done with it. And if anybody has a problem with that, that's up to the pastors to interpret it and figure out how that makes sense. Okay, so that's one way. The other option is to actually open up this can of worms and help the translator see what's going on and why there might be differences in the versions. Now, the three main versions that I usually look at in Spanish are the Reina Valera 1960, the NIV Spanish, and the Dios Habla Hoy, which is kind of an NLT equivalent. And NIV also has Sons of Israel. Now, it's really interesting what Dios Habla Hoy did in this situation. They punted and avoided the whole problem completely in this kind of sleight of hand, I would say, translation. So, here's what it is in Spanish first for those who understand. Hubo una vez en que el Altísimo hizo reparto de hombres y naciones y fijó las fronteras de los pueblos, pero tomó en cuenta a los israelitas. Now here's a fairly literal back translation into English of that. There was a time when the Most High divided men and nations and established the borders of peoples, but he took the Israelites into account. Now it's a very creative solution. But you can see that they did decide that the original text, what they think is the original text, is sons of Israel, because they mention that he took the Israelites into account. Now, while I am convinced that the original text said sons of God, at the same time, I am completely sympathetic to those who would be confused by seeing all of these major Spanish translations saying sons of Israel and wonder, what's going on here? And so was the translator. So, at the end of the day, after talking through this and spending I don't know how long on trying to navigate this and understand the ins and outs of it with the translator, she opted for Sons of Israel. And this is where the reality of Bible translation sets in. Sometimes you can be really excited about being able to explain this other way of seeing the text And even after all of that, even though you have a decently strong opinion one way or the other, at the end of the day, tradition will often take over. But it was a good learning experience for the translator, for myself, and I hope for you who are listening. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey, and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help us all treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.